I was just saying that the, the, the title of my talk, was, we had quite a discussion about what, what we should call it, and we decided, we'd, rather than calling it South Australia's History, its future, we should call it What Lies Ahead, South Australia's History, What Lies Ahead. It seems to me that's a very a rather ambitious title. You might wonder what sort of ambitions are revealed in the title of, of such a talk. Um, you might ask who I am to foretell the future of South Australia's history, and, and what's more claim this is partly my own responsibility. I do also believe that it's your responsibility and after I've sketched out some of the work that I shall be doing myself as a History Trust historian, I'll discuss a range of issues which may affect all of you who are personally and professionally involved in Australian as well as South Australian history. It's actually easiest to justify my right and, if you like, my duty to speak on behalf of South Australian history if I introduce myself with a title which I don't actually use, which isn't in common use and that is a state historian. Probably only a few South Australians have heard of the work of Victoria's state historian, Dr Bernard Barrett, although I noticed there was some publicity recently in the newspapers about Dr Barrett referring to Eureka as a massacre. Um, when Eureka is such a, uh, an event of such great national interest that it's quite, it made headlines in most of the newspapers. But most people, when they hear that name, would expect such a being to be an historian on government pay and Rob mentioned earlier that I have existed, eked out a living as a professional historian for several years, so being on government pay is quite an unusual experience. Um, while not towing any party line on the state's past, they might expect that she would be in the public eye, unlike most historians who are reputedly shy and retiring types, and that she would give advice on matters historical to government agencies and to South Australians in general. Well, such, assum such assumptions about a state historian are more or less correct. The title would also suggest a formal commitment on the part of the state government to the place of history in South Australian affairs. Certainly, successive state governments in South Australia have given considerable support to the History Trust, although I would question their commitment to history in its broader sense in South Australia. So a prime target of the state historian's efforts to promote an awareness of and sensibility towards history is the government itself and the public service. Historical Society members will have heard talks, obviously, and read about the History Trust and probably visited some of its historical museums. Most publicity has been given to these historical museums, which now include the Birdwood Mill, Old Parliament House, of course, the Migration Museum and the South Australian Maritime Museum. This public focus on the museums reflects the concentration of the History Trust itself on setting them up which required almost the entire resources of that new organisation, which was set up as a statutory authority only in 1981. But the organisation was set up as a history trust, not simply as a museum's trust, although I can remember some historians murmuring rather darkly that they should be renamed a museum's trust. St stated broadly, the trust's responsibility is to promote South Australian history. Responsibility for the History Trust Museums and its support for the 150 or so other museums in South Australia are certainly its major concerns, but they're by no means its only ones. Nor should they be, unless the Trust very narrowly delimits the ways in which South Australian history is promoted. So almost from the start, other activities were undertaken, such as the um, reading guides and chronologies provided by the information officer Brian Samuels, you saw earlier, um, and the publication of the first historian, my predecessor, Dr. John Jagenza, who is also here tonight. But there were and there still are large gaps in the sphere of operations outside administration and museums, and that is my place. Ironically, one of the ways in which I commonly describe my work, especially to people who are completely outside the sphere of history, is to say that I'm the historian, capital H, <laughs> as there are several of us on the staff, as you might expect, working for the History Trust. And then I must explain that the History Trust is the one that runs those big historical museums and then say that I don't work for the museums, I work in the non-museum sphere. So it's a rather convoluted way of explanation for what I do. As I mentioned earlier, this role did exist well before I started in February this year. But while I've stepped into an existing position, I've effectively to create a new role. As you might expect, this is by no means intended as a criticism of Dr. Tregenza. As one of the Trust's pioneers, he was, like other members of that hardy band, much taken up with planning and putting into effect activities across the whole range of trust responsibility, especially re relating to what was then known as the Social History Museum, and also the Jubilee 150 Treasures Room, most of you may have also visited, which is located within the Mortlock Library. 
And this was all happening at the same time as the lead-up to the state's best centenary in 1986, and Dr Tregenza was also involved with that, especially with publications and the preliminary planning for what became the Wakefield Press. A third important area of his work was on historical pictures, with publications and the compilation of the massive historical pictures index, and I would strongly recommend those of you who are doing research and are not familiar with that to visit the Mortlock Library. It's a marvellous resource. Well, of course, now that setting up phase is over for the History Trust, hopefully, <laughs> as it's landed with more new museums I hadn't been expecting. And with the consolidation comes the opportunity for the directorate staff that is outside the museum, at least, to expand their other activities. The Jubilee 150 year, of course, is behind us, and even the Wakefield Press has been sold by the government and has passed out of public control. The Historical Pictures Index has been handed over to the Mortlock Library. In short, the way is clear now for a new work by the History Trust historian. Now, you may have noticed with all this preamble that I've so far cleverly avoided explaining what my work is. Um, you might even suspect that I'll now stop and ask for some helpful suggestions from the floor. But, and I certainly hope tonight uh, that there is enough time for some discussion of that kind. Um, because I do believe that there's a lot of scope for cooperation between the History Trust and the Historical Society and, and with individual historians and, and people who are interested in South Australian history. Nevertheless, the History Trust and I have uh, made several plans and have even embarked upon several projects, and as I promised, I'll outline these. The History Trust itself did become aware of its new opportunity and its obligation to broaden its range of activities. And this is reflected in the brief for my position, which was prepared in 1987. I'll read this. The duties are, in summary, to foster and promote the study of South Australian history, carry out major research projects, foster trust publication programs, and undertake related policy and project work. Apart from being required to prepare histories and policy papers on my own and with the director of museum staff, there's much emphasis in this duty statement on the public role of the historian. This could be described as outreach to individuals and organisations other than the local museums and the schools who are already catered for within the Trust. As you may perhaps know, there are individual education officers attached to each of the museums. That still leaves a very large group indeed, and the duty statement for the historian spells out some of the forms such outreach could take. They include promoting the development of higher standards of research and publication by historical societies and individual practitioners fostering interaction between the trust and the academic community, publicising South Australian history through the mass media, lectures and seminars, and five minutes on a touch of elegance, which is obligatory for anybody, <laughs> um, and answering public inquiries. Given my introductory remarks, it should come as no surprise to you that until now, the History Trust has done very little outreach of that kind and has actually kept its own existence mostly out of the public eye. Some joint projects have been carried out, such as guided historical walks and publications, and most of these have been done in association with the other cultural institutions along North Terrace. And there's scope for much more work of that kind, especially as all such institutions, including the Trust, must work within very strictly limited budgets, even as public demand for their services increases. Soon after I started as historian, the information officer and the museum's officer and I formed an outreach team which is meeting with those staff in that such institution and where, where needed, giving advice. Each of us also has individual responsibilities of that kind. I've so far concentrated on three, liaising with the academic community, making contact with the media and promoting links between History Trust staff and tertiary institutions in particular. Such contacts are not limited to academic historians, academic historians and their students. There are many other courses in which students would benefit from gaining some knowledge of the state's history and from learning some useful historical skills and write, research and writing skills. In many cases, they would seem to be essential. Um, and although this isn't widely recognised, it may not be due to the fact that lecturers are actively disinclined to use history as simply due to their own lack of historical skills or knowledge. One obvious and important example of such an area of need is in, is in the tourism sector, and that is now being taught as a course in the, in the technical and further education sector. There are several ways of catering for this need. You could advise the lecturers, you could lecture the students, you can suggest research topics, and act as what they call a resource person, which makes me feel like a mineral, <laughs> for students working on such, on such projects. But finally, and perhaps most fundamentally, uh, one can help to create new courses. 
There is cooperation already between the Trust and the School of Tourism and Hospitality at Adelaide College of Cape, and it is such that I've already been able to start on most of those forms of um, attack, I suppose is the right word, but most important is the pilot course called Tourism and Australia's Multicultural Heritage, which I'm developing in partnership with Tim Clemo, who is a lecturer in tourism at that college. Our project aims to teach the tourism students who are doing the three-year Diploma in Tourism course to more fully appreciate and then in turn themselves to interpret the landscape by using histories and heritage surveys, by making their own observations and doing research using such forms of evidence as historical documents and pictures, physical relics such as buildings and artefacts and oral information was one of the marvellous things about well, historical research and tourist promotion in, within Australia is that there's a, hundreds of thousands of people who have that direct personal experience of the historical development. Um, for example, you can't go to Rome and speak to an original Roman, but you can certainly speak to many people who have got virtually oral, oral, oral evidence for historical occupation of the land going right back. And of course, in this case, I'm including Aboriginal occupation as well as European. This particular course will also alert students to the complexities of our social and physical environment. It's one source of continuing frustration that there's a kind of a blanket um, image is, is passed across by the tourism industry. And in this project, we're concentrating on the historical consequences of German immigration in the 19th century and, as you might expect, directing attention to the Barossa Valley, which is already renowned for that reason and, in fact, is subject to a number of myths rather than realities. Um, and is even in danger of destroying that heritage due to insensitive tourist promotion. A further aim, then, of this project is to make students aware of the need for sensitivity in conducting tourism, especially in areas with such distinctive cultures. What we plan to do with the course, uh, which will start next year, is to have a series of classroom lectures and then a series of tours through time. We will actually visit the Barossa at certain periods in its history to really teach the students to see that there is a difference, that, that history isn't some vast amorphous thing previous to the Second World War, perhaps, or the First World War, but in actual fact there are, there are differences in years, differences in, in social groups, even within social groups, to be able to read that landscape, to be able to observe that from the buildings and, and so on which have survived. What will then happen, having done all that, is that they will use, the students will use the skills they've learnt in that pilot course to interpret themselves another region in South Australia, and that work will in turn replace the Barossa as the focus of the future course. This joint venture between the History Trust and the Adelaide College of TAFE was one of the last projects commissioned and funded by the Committee to Review Australian Studies in Tertiary Education, which is, it was familiarly known as CRASTI, by the rather fortunate name of CRASTI, this committee was appointed by the federal government with funds provided by the Australian Bicentennial Authority and it operated between 1987 and the end, 1984 and the end of 1987. Crafty strongly argued for the need to develop and implement Australian studies across the ter tertiary curriculum. In fact, it was infamous for recommending Australianising the hairdressing course, I think was probably the thing that was given the most publicity. But for amongst other reasons, as a practical means of more closely linking tertiary study with actual employment needs. That pragmatic intent is important, but there were many other well-argued reasons for increasing the Australian content of courses, in particular for increasing historical understanding. In an address given to teachers in 1985, the chairman, Humphrey McQueen, argued that we study history so as not to be culturally illiterate. He stressed the presence and the personal benefits of such understanding, and he said, an historical sensibility is not confined to the past, rather it enriches our comprehension of the present, enabling us to distinguish the flotsam from the tide, and allowing us to see that the makers of history are not a breed apart. The greatest lesson of history is that we are making it. And this really brings me to the second part of my talk tonight, which is about the making of, of South Australian history, and who plays a part in that making. I'll introduce this by way of a discussion of some of the issues which I, see, I think directly affect that process of history making. In this year, 1988, I obviously can't go past the first and most lavishly publicised issue facing historians in 1988, and that is, of course, the bicentenary of formal British settlement in Australia. You may notice that I immediately diverged from the Australian Bicentennial Authority in how I describe this event, that is, by specifying that it concerns the advent of British settlement although I don't go so far in parochialism as to disclaim any relevance of that event in New South Wales history, 
because the Aborigines retained sole ownership of most of what became South Australia until 1836. So what does this event mean to us? It's not a celebration of Australian nationhood. Presumably that's reserved for the year 2001, and I hope many of us will be around to, to celebrate that too. It can even be claimed that the official bicentenary does little to commemorate Australianness. Many activities, it seems to me, have been planned to take place Australia-wide, but very few of them seem to commemorate genuinely Australia-wide historical themes or events. A glance at the contents of the most important, I believe, the most important commemorative history, which wasn't funded by the ABA, which was the Australian, Australians, the Historical Library, and the, looking at their contents will reveal many of these, what I call, Australia-wide themes. Um, section headings in different volumes are given such titles as family, work, farming, people moving, which I think is a very important theme, the whole business of social mobility, which transcends state boundaries and regional boundaries, assimilation and after, and religion and politics. In short, as was written in the final volume of that series, these books aim to help readers to understand the experience of humanity in this continent from its beginnings, 50 or 60,000 years ago, to 1988. That series of volumes pays serious attention to Aboriginal history, both before and after 1788. But the official bicentenary is not a celebration of the beginnings of human occupation of this continent, as that dates from as far back as 60,000 years. Nor does it commemorate significant dates of arrival after 1788 in places other than Port Jackson and by peoples other than the British. All of those questions are relevant to South Australia, and so why is there so little public discussion of them here? And why is there no sign of such a response to the bicentenary, for example, in the Historical Society of South Australia's lecture program for 1988? Where are the feature articles invited from historians in the Appetizer and the Adelaide Review? These questions are important also because they have hardly been addressed even simply within the context of South Australian history alone. In fact, despite my comments about or against the official bicentenary, it has certainly stimulated debates about the meaning of our past, which thus... Um, and whereas South Australians recall our own Jubilee 150 with great pride, um, but 1986 was, I think, by contrast, more or less pure celebration, with nothing like the serious questioning of identity, the focus on Aboriginal European relations, and so on. There were several sesquicentenary books which did address some of those issues, um, although, but the one major Aboriginal work is still not yet published, and the contents of others, such as The Flinders History of South Australia and Living in South Australia by Elizabeth Kwan, have yet to gain any, pub any great publicity. There are many gaps even in the scholarly research of South Australian history, for example in post-contact Aboriginal history, or work which relates local events to the wider world of, or offers comparisons with other places. There's been very little done on any aspect of the 20th century, especially since World War II, as I found to my regret when I started upon the history of the South Australian Housing Trust. There's nothing like having to research the history of the 20th century before you start on your own subject. In his capacity as Education Department History Consultant, one of the Historical Society founders, Ron Gibbs, criticised what he called cultural apartheid in the teaching and, I believe for that matter, in the public presentation of Australian history. He wrote, how far are we coming to grips with the great debate now about the role of Aboriginal people in the Australian story? His further comments are also worth repeating as they are also accurate. He drew attention to other gaps in history course content, such as the spread of rural settlement, whaling and sealing, and the overemphasis on the early period of Australia's history and on the political and the economic. Then he wrote, when we look at the history of South Australia, some strange misunderstandings emerge we still echo the common view that the settlement of the colony was the result of company enterprise, while Wakefield seems all important, and the paradise of dissent is explained in only one of its meanings. As for its later history, too much is left unexplained. Our history, he said, is left in stereotype. Now, those comments were made in 1980, but there's still, there's still much stereotype in popular perceptions of South Australian history. If anything, I think it's been reinforced by the sesquicentenary and the bicentenary, and such bodies as the Historical Society and the History Trust have made only modest efforts to challenge those views. Biting the hand that feeds me. <laughs> of course, the Bicentennial Authority and all those local committees and individuals are perfectly entitled to commemorate the events of 1788. It is equally valid that others should use the occasion of the Bicentenary to accomplish other historical purposes. As you may have gathered, I think that our state's historical organisations should be doing so.
Fortunately, other groups have seized that opportunity and most importantly, Aboriginal people have succeeded in publicising their own history of the past 200 years, not just for its own sake, but as explanation for continuing problems in race relations and for Aboriginal desires for self-determination. We all enjoy bashing the media, especially the newspapers, but in this case I feel that most Australian newspapers have devoted a lot of space to the Aboriginal case. I'm sure this is partly because controversy helps to sell the news, but history is controversial and it's about time that percolated to the popular press. And this brings me to another issue facing us at present, which is how do we present history? Should we go beyond the commemorative to the controversial or the critical view of history? Are our public organisations, such as the History Trust and the Historical Societies, responsible simply for what might be called rescuing facts <coughs> or objects and presenting them in a competent but uncomplicated manner in the form of public lectures, articles and displays? Certainly, as long as we consider ignorance of our past is widespread and the heedless destruction of our heritage in papers, brick and bluestone a continuing threat, we should continue with that rescue work. But history itself and the practice of both academic and public history is more sophisticated than simple presentation of fact and preservation of objects. So should these organisations also be concerned with more fundamental questions about the meaning and purpose of history and the different perspectives of history and the biases, as well as the methods of history making? Luckily I came into the History Trust just as it was more seriously debating those sorts of issues and there is some support, at least in theory, for the Trust to provide both historical information and to communicate what it calls the principles and methods developed by historians in studying the past. How far the adoption of a principle, of a principle in those words will satisfy the need I've described and perhaps more importantly, how successfully will that message be communicated to the many thousands of museum visitors and readers? Perhaps such intellectual concerns should be left to the universities or to historians working on what are called serious commissioned works. But I feel that that is not the case. And after all, the Historical Society, for example, includes in its lecture program and its journal contributions of that questioning kind from historians both within and outside academic institutions. But I think much more effort should be made by the Society and the History Trust to convey that new and more questioning work to the popular audience and the amateur historians, the Society and the Trust primarily first. I certainly intend to do so in my own work as History Trust historian and as Historical Society member <laughs> recently and re-elected. I believe a large part of my present work should involve what I call practical bridge building between amateur and professional, academic and non-academic, between private or inaccessible information and the public domain, and, if you like, between the converted and the as yet unconverted missionaries. <laughs> this applies even in the more limited sphere of what I called earlier rescuing history. I believe that the society and the history trust should more consistently and publicly emphasise the importance of history, for instance, within the schools, and of the necessity to preserve and make accessible the historical evidence which is the source of historical knowledge. Certainly most of us have for a long time been concerned with rescuing and interpreting history and historical evidence, but only some of us seem to have recognised that such evidence includes buildings, objects and personal recollections, and so have also become involved in heritage conservation, historical museums and oral history. It's now well known that oral history, for example, provides a valuable source of evidence, or at least experience, of history from below but it still seems to be only poorly understood that the study of material culture can be valuable in reconstructing the past experiences of the majority of ordinary men and women who've left very few literary records of their own. Dr Brian Dickey presented a paper at the Australian Historical Association Conference in 1986 in which he stressed the importance of preserving a variety of historical buildings reflecting that variety of history. He argued further that historians have a vital responsibility to participate in the development of values and procedures by which what is called heritage is defined. I must confess that I've been dismayed at times by the continuing refus refusal of this society to give public support to such concerns, not necessarily in terms of individual buildings but the issues at last. And this is despite the obvious enormous popularity of society visits to historical places. It's no answer from either the Historical Society or the History Trust that such matters are dealt with by other societies or agencies, such as the National Trust and the State Heritage Branch. Partly what worries me is that if you have a, such a fragmented view of history, it means that history is kept in a small box labelled books, lectures, displays. 
which is quite separate from the environment in which most of us carry out our daily lives. We can then hardly blame our potential audiences, which include public servants, developers, politicians, family historians, journalists and teachers, for doing the same thing, which means that a sensitivity to history may be entirely absent from their decision-making or their methods of work. We should be strongly conveying the message that history is as immediate and as intimately important to the South Australians as our local neighbourhood, as varied as the neighbourhood's social relations and its assortment of buildings, and as vulnerable and as liable to change. We should aim to rouse attention to and to care for the whole historical environment. I believe what I'm really talking about is presenting a connected view of history, and I believe that connected view is best conveyed by historians and the historical organisations. In any case, in practice, the specialist organisations can rarely provide that service. At the very least, we should work cooperatively with them. There is another aspect to that unconnected presentation of history, even if you exclude heritage and such things. Most published history and um, the public presentation of history by historical organisations concentrate of necessity on particular topics and themes. For example, we have ships, we have cars, we have constitutional history. Who is responsible for the bits left out? And there are an awful lot of them. And who provides the general historical context or even the connecting narrative? There's Professor Graham Davison of Monash University wrote an essay recently which criticises some of the new history textbooks in schools for jettisoning, jettisoning narrative history in favour of brief statements broken up by pictures. He wrote that this made it harder to teach students, in his words, a sense of the broader contours of history. Students will tend to jump like jet age tourists from one exotic island of time to the next, but with scarcely a glance at the great tracts of time in between. I think that we're open to similar criticism and to charges of textbook history or presenting history in a textbook form, and even, heaven forbid, antiquarianism, the ultimate epithet. <laughs> I've found that this, is, this actually is voiced by some academic historians when the matter of their increasing the teaching or, of Australian, or worse, South Australian history, is raised. Until and unless the subject of South Australian history is shown to be as complex and, and drawing upon the same rigorous comparative and theoretical methods as in use in other cultures and in other places, South Australian history will remain marginal, even to so-called mainstream Australian and academic histories. We've all complained over times about South Australia being left out of so-called general Australian history and the eastern states bias we all mutter about so darkly. And that demonstration of that complexity and that significance is partly up to us. And that brings me back to my beginning where I made a claim for our shared responsibility for South Australian history. So now I would ask if you have any comments or passionate disagreements or even kindly suggestions. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I, that's often been the argument that's put. And... Um, Sorry, <laughs> speak again. I was saying I think it's, it's, it's probably a lot more effective to second guess. I mean, it's easy enough to say now that there's going to be, <laughs> you know, buildings are going to be demolished and, and buildings that we probably will feel concerned about and to try and do some thinking ahead about what we think is important, as I said, as a form of historical evidence and as a form of, um, well, as I've just said earlier, even if you like a place for historical society <laughs> members to visit, um, it, all of those things are important to us. And that's what I'm really trying to say, that, that, that I think there's a place for the so-called lunatic fringe and I think there's a place for you know, unions to picket buildings and so on and so forth. And the place of the historical organisation is perhaps more sober, if you like, and, and it might well be, um, but it hopefully has a longer-term effect because it might stop to make people think ahead of time about the historical significance of what they're doing. That's what I'm really arguing for. Yes, they do. And obviously, it's, I'm not, as I said, I'm not arguing for us to do what the National Trust is doing. And, but interestingly enough, what the, the National Trust has recognised that it does need historians and has taken them on board. <laughs> and um, But even so, this, this, well, just because the environment is so vast and there's so much going on all the time, it's only a relatively new thing for the National Trust to try and place things in historical context. Um, what used to happen, of course, was that te generally tended to happen was that local communities felt very strongly about particular buildings and those were what went on to the register. So this, I still think there's a place for, as, at least as I said, cooperating with the National Trust in assessing the significance of our, of our whole historical environment. 
and in, and just simply in publicising it, in having lectures about um, the historical aspects of heritage, um, in trying to contribute to that public debate because it's still a very emotive one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is a, it is a problem. I actually had a consultation with a friend about that, and he said to that you must do something that seemed to be unusual and controversial, and I I gave up on that idea. <laughs> um, it depends really which which press which media you talk about for a start. Um, I remember talking with Bernard Barrett, the state historian in Victoria, last year about this, and uh, he, he expressed very warm feelings about the um, radio. <laughs> you know, his favourite media, form of media was radio. Um, I suppose because it is more flexible, it gives you more time, uh, it's less uh, under the thumb of what seemed to be very stringent, as you just said, you know, you really just about have to have a controversy or, or something very spectacular or whatever to get into the paper. I found I had, I, for example, recently went to speak with the editor of Messenger of Press and um, he was very keen on printing, for example, printing a series of historical photographs, hopefully we'll do with incorporation with Old Parliament House. Um, and my idea for that was, to, was a two-way thing, which is what I'm really on about, which was printing these photographs, which are marvellous ones, um, um, about which we don't know very much at all. We, we often will we know that it's Coromandel Valley full stop in, in about the 1920s, and so to print these to get reader reactions, and as you might expect, um, they said they do get a lot of response from that sort of request. So there's an example of something where, I suppose, you're meeting, you're meeting the media halfway, that it's already a formula, if you like, that, that they like, but at the same time it's not, I don't know, prostituting one's art. <laughs> um, I've got mixed feelings about just writing articles straight out for, say, the Sunday Mail, because as an example, because I feel that is done already, um, and I'm not quite sure what purpose that serves. Um, I've certainly done that. The... I'm trying to think. The other area, as I said earlier, was radio. So I'll be doing some work on on the ABC radio, just a, a series of work. So what I'm really trying to say is that I'm having to do quite specific things for different media, um, and it's gradually gradually whittling it down, I suppose. Um, but I agree with you. It is a problem because I feel that if if I just make a, a thing that seems once off or seems controversial or spectacular or whatever, I'm not really getting very far. Um, if, I'm, if I'm talking about trying to break down public stereotypes of history or what Rob was also talking about, facts and figures history. I think uh, partly the thing to do, and it's something I have been doing, I suppose, is simply to make the personal contact, even in even that term, even, so that even in the back of their minds when they do have space and do want to write about something, or when something comes up. One of the things that Bernard Barrett has done is this con almost constant dialogue between him and the media. If something comes up, they will ring him up, and it may not ostensibly be historical. It may well be that, I don't know, um, there's some mining in the Ballarat area, but they'll have Bernard Barrett commenting about that. And, and it seems as he's been doing this for a long time. Perhaps that's partly the thing, but he, he does have that, that image, if you like. There is that, that sense that there is a historical dimension and there is someone around who can comment on it with some authority. So that's, I suppose that's another intention, but that, that's a much longer process. I think I've asked, I might ask my boss about it. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we've, we've discussed this, of course, um, and again, really, it's a matter of me being... I mean, there may be occasions <coughs> where I'm actually called upon to provide expert expert evidence, such as has been happening this week with the Working Women's Crash. Not that I've done it, but another historian has been doing that. Um, but otherwise, really, my role is to take that step back that I talked about in terms of the historical society, which is to... Um, Give advice on the on the more general historical aspect rather <coughs> rather than on individual buildings. The city of Adelaide is a bit complicated, I must admit, because as maybe some people are probably aware, I was one of the original three consultants who actually prepared the city of Adelaide survey and worked on the register items. So I do have, I suppose, that specific expertise which may be called upon. But that's that's historical accident, if that's the right way of describing it. Um, I do obviously, I, as for the past. Oh, eight years, eight, nine years, I suppose a good half of my work has been heritage consultancy work, so that obviously partly explains my concern about heritage matters. Um, but I do think, as I say, that that I've always felt that's just but one aspect of historical work. Um, and I've, it's the same way that I've been very involved with oral history and have tried to promote that too. I don't... I, I mean... I do. <laughs> I have emphasised the heritage first. As I was really trying to say, was I think that um, 
there's all sorts of other forms of evidence. I mean, I've talked about oral evidence and so on. I mean, another whole area is the whole business of personal documents and so on. Um, that again, there are agencies which collect them. There's a public record office and there's the Mortlock Library and so on. But again, they're pretty well engrossed in, in, in the work to hand. And there's, there's not, again, this, 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 um, what's the word? Bridging to the public domain. I mean, there's a lot of people who simply don't even know that it exists. And so again, I think, I really do think that one of the functions of public historical organisations like the History Trust and the Historical Society are the two obvious ones, is, is to get that out of those places into the public domain, to get that awareness out. Um, and uh, because it's all there, the information is all there. It's not as if it's something that people have to go and dig up on their own account. Um, yeah, I'm talking myself dry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would actually have a story of my own. I remember about a year ago I was asked to, um, well, I did, I was commissioned to work on, um, I'll give it away if I say what it was, <laughs> I'm sure I say broadly on Outback South Australian history, and I was commissioned to work on the 19th century, of course, because that's what historians do. And when I said I inquired whether they were going to be covering such topics as Woomera and Maralinga um, and other rather important 20th century things, the person I was in contact with who was organising all this said, can you do that too? <laughs> I said, oh yes, historians don't cut out at the end of the 19th century, so there's still this belief that somehow you have the 19th century for historians and then you employ a journalist or a media consultant to do the 20th century. Um, so, yes, my short answer is whatever I work on. In fact, I've got a, my, the, the 20th century is a bit of a pet for me. <laughs> That's the right word. I've always been interested in 20th century history. When I wrote my very first history, which is the history of Woodville, um, I sailed along quite happily in the 19th century. Then I hit the 20th and I suddenly found myself on my own. And I, and it was very good for me. And, and uh, what I learnt was, that, I, that was when I really learnt that one has to make history, that, the, that that's what history is. It doesn't, isn't something that just exists in old books because it, it, it just wasn't around, especially then. This was back in 1975. So I've, I've always, if you like, got that dimension in my mind. Whatever I work on, there's various things I'll be working on, like the Barossa project. Um, I mentioned that we're, we're taking trips to the Barossa through time. What we're actually doing is going to the Barossa in 1850 and 1900. In the 1940s, particularly focusing on the impact on that German heritage of things such as internship and the refusal to have German spoken in the Lutheran churches. And in the present, we'll be going to the Barossa in the present, but by that time, people will be learning to see, really see the present rather than just <laughs> take it for granted. So, in other words, half the course is actually on the 20th century. Um, and so that's an example. Yeah. I have, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm really hard time about that because if you're really curious about it histor as a historian, you say, well, that's all, that's all valid history too. I mean, it's valid in the sense that people, human beings do things and that's history, isn't it? <laughs> so whether it's, it's fake in that sense or not, um, you know, this is just a bit of a problem. But so, well, certainly when we take them up to the Barossa, we'll be pointing these things out. But if you're talking about um, teaching the tourism operators to be sensitive to the real heritage of the valley, um, then you're also going to be using that fake stuff, if you like, to say, well, for example, um, one or two of the early Vigneron were only were Bavarian, and for a start, the whole Bavarian thing is completely false and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing is that the um, <laughs> we were talking with the manager of the Colin Grove homestead, National Trust, Colin Grove Homestead. Now, Colin Grove, as you may know, is actually situated in the non-German part of the Barossa Valley. Have you heard about the non-German part of the Barossa Valley? And we mentioned how we also wanted to bring the students to Colin Grove and to talk about the non-German heritage of the valley too. And he fell on our shoulders and cried with relief because he said <laughs> no one ever talked about the non-German heritage of the Barossa Valley. And I think that's an example, really, where that, that, that in a way one stereotyped image is totally blown up and, and it really swamps what's actually happened. So, so that's really where, where we lie. But as I say, um, tourism in the Barossa, even the name Barossa Valley, we're, we're beginning to, to find out is an invention. It wasn't called the Barossa Valley, it's Barossa. Um, and so even that itself, the, the impact of tourism in the valley is quite a long thing. And, and that in itself has become part of that historical development of the valley. So it's quite interesting. Yes, yeah, it is. It is a problem. Um, I'm hoping that it's happened late enough that that it's not too late, if you see what I mean. That that, it, that in, in other parts of the world where this tourism, of course, has been much stronger for much longer, um, then a lot of things have been lost. But I think here now there is, well, for a start, there's a profession of historians. There's, there's, there are a lot, there's a lot more 
there are a lot more articulate people around about, and even, and for example, in the Barossa itself, there's almost evenly divided between Barossa people who are promoting this false image, if you like, and the other half who are really infuriated by the same thing and, and really feel that their own heritage is under threat. So I think that that's stronger perhaps than we give it credit for. Mm. Mm. Well, that's true, but I don't, uh, I, was, I think that's also a very defensive argument. If you cut back, you cut back, you cut back the people who are there, therefore you're given fewer resources. I always remember this probably not apocryphal story about uh, Sir Thomas Clayford, who was, um, I think the story goes, John Clayford might know better than me, the story goes something like um, he was going, he told the education department, which, which was then responsible for the library, that he was going to cut back, no, he told the education department he was going to cut back so many hundreds of thousands of dollars from its budget this year. And when he asked them about it, they said, yes, they, they cut it out of the library's budget. And he said, well, thank you, but I wanted you to, you to cut it out, so I'll take, I'll take another cut out of, the, out of your budget. So in other words, you, you can't win. I think that, that approach, the thing to do, it seems to me, is, is firstly to publicise that, and secondly, to see where, to find ways in which we can help, if you like, to work, work together with the Mortlock. That's something our outreach team, if you like, is already starting to discuss with the Mortlock Library staff. Um, and one of the answers, I think, is to, uh, teach people to use those resources better, to teach people how to, I mean a lot of time is simply taken up with people needing help um, and uh, and all people coming one after the other with almost identical needs um, which might well be better met by a group of people being taken through. We, we were talking about that the other day, um, one of the librarians there taking lecturers through who then send their students in but, but the lecturers have been told what the limitations are as well as the resources in the Mortlock Library. Um, and as I say, I think it's a danger just to say we'll keep cutting back and cutting back on the hours, the contracts or whatever. Yes, that's true. Well, I mean, again, though, even books like um, Andrew Creek's book, um, most people will have seen, is a help. I mean, there's, there are things which are being produced not by the Mortlock, but which obviously depend on the Mortlock's assistance, um, which will uh, hopefully lessen some of that burden. Mm -hmm. <laughs>